Welcome to UO Today. I'm Steve Shankman, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest is John Vole, a visiting lecturer who has been brought to campus by the Wolf Professorship of the Oregon Humanities Center and also by International Studies and Religious Studies. In conjunction with the new class on Islam and Global Forces, Professor Vole is presenting a lecture entitled Burkas, Bikinis, and Hip Hop, Different Kinds of Muslims. John Vole is Professor of Islamic History and the Associate Director of the Prince Al-Walid bin Talal Center for Muslim Christian Understanding at Georgetown University. He did his undergraduate work at Dartmouth, and he earned his master's and doctorate from Harvard. His research interests include Islamic movements and world history. He's the editor, author, or co-author of eight books, including with John Esposito, Makers of Contemporary Islam. His research for a book already under contract is currently focused on religious revival and renewal in the world of the 18th century. It's really great to have you with us It's today. a pleasure to be here. Uh, tell us, first of all, about the, your, the, the Center for Muslim-Christian Relations. How long has it been going? What kinds of things do you actually do? The Center has been in existence for about 12 years now. Uh, it was established by Lebanese businessmen at the end of the Lebanese Civil War, Muslim and Christian businessmen who tried to decide what can we do to mm -hmm. uh, help Muslim-Christian relations get better. Uh, bottom line was they figured that what was really needed was correct information and means for communicating that information. And they wanted it in a scholarly context rather than a policy think tank or uh, some kind of political organization. Um, so they came to Georgetown. They'd had a lot of reasons for working with a Jesuit institution from Beirut and uh, asked Georgetown what they would do if they got the money to establish a center. And uh, John Esposito put together a proposal for Georgetown. And the basic proposal, which then John became the founding director, and I came then in the first year of operation afterwards, the basic uh, operation of the center is at three levels. It's a curricular scholarly program and so that we provide courses for all of the courses at Georgetown and majors rather than being a separate program we're not a, a ghetto for religious understanding we have courses that are usable in all of the majors at all levels and then we generate information we hold conferences we support scholars and so on and we try and disseminate information which means we spend a lot of time talking with journalists, with government officials, with business officials. That kind of, in a nutshell, is what we do. So uh, so it actually started before 9-11, then? It started before 9-11. Mm -hmm. It started really... Because of the Lebanese, yeah, Lebanese it started, Civil War. It was inspired by the Lebanese right. Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, Muslim-Christian relations have been a, something of a problem for a few centuries. Right, <laughs> I, I, exactly. So tell me some concrete results that have happened as a, as a result of having this program. Are, are Christian-Muslim relations any better uh, in the world today? I think um, since 9-11 in particular, it's the easiest kind of thing to, to look to, that uh, people in the United States, in North America, uh, ended up having this feeling that they didn't know uh, each other and the first thing that the center helped people to do was to get a much better recognition of the fact that there are Muslims in the United States. <clears throat> and so that we've had a number of books that are now reasonably widely used in classrooms on Muslims in America. And then we've had conferences and facilitation meetings for getting people together. I think one of the things that surprised us in that effort was uh, something that we were able to do in the Muslim community itself. In the United States, uh, Muslims come from a lot of different countries, but there are really two different categories. You have m probably about 60 to 70 percent of the Muslims in the United States are relatively recent immigrant communities uh, from Iran, from Egypt, and from all over. But there's also an indigenous American Muslim community 
within the African American community. Mm -hmm. And these two communities have totally separate histories, or had totally separate histories. And one of the things that we discovered in the 1990s in general, and then after 9-11 in particular, was that an institution like the Center for Muslim Christian Understanding ended up creating opportunities for these two different kinds of Muslims to talk to each other before they could talk to Christians. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up working with a number of uh, African American Muslim organizations and immigrant Muslim organizations and helping them get together as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, this goes in some sense probably to the, the title of your lecture, Burkas, <coughs> Bikinis, and Hip Hop. That is, uh, you don't think of those necessarily going together. There are different kind of Muslims around, as you were just That's saying, right. African American mm -hmm. who are more indigenous to mm -hmm. American culture, recent recent immigrants. You, you want to let us know about the different kinds of Muslims there are, even in the United States. That's right. And I think that, to me, um, probably the important kind of missionary activity is that people now are aware that there are Muslims in the world. I mean, when I started teaching 45 years ago, uh, I was teaching up at the University of New Hampshire, and the first major mission then was to let people know that really there are such things as Muslims, and they exist in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, everybody is aware that Muslims exist, but the, the filter of headlines means that most people think that most Muslims are fanatics and terrorists in the same way that the filter for the American identity and the rest of the world still is pretty much, they all think of us as wondering if we ride horses and are cowboys or we're gangsters or something like that from the movies. Um, so that what I want to, what I tend to try and do is to say, okay, sure, we've got the extreme literalist, exclusivist kinds of people. These are, I mean, best symbolized, I think, in people's image uh, by the burqa. Mm -hmm. And then, if you really think about it, everybody knows that there are lots of Muslims who are totally modernized and so on, and will swim around in their bikinis. Mm -hmm. But what we don't have is a real sense of what most Muslims most of the time are dealing with, which is pretty much the same thing as everybody else. They have religious faith, they have cultural tradition, and they are faced with the changes of contemporary modernity. And <coughs> And so that the question then becomes, how can you create a new synthesis? And I use particularly the burqa bikini thing at this point because one of the examples that comes to me of how you combine these is something called a burkini. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in Australia, you have a lot of Muslim women who would like to go swimming, but they don't want to go swimming naked, or as they would think of themselves as naked, just by wearing a regular bikini or something like that. And <clears throat> so there is a clothing designer who has designed an Islamically appropriate swimming suit for very modern Australian Muslims. I see, but it couldn't be a, it couldn't be a real burkini. There well, would be too much, too much exposure. I it's, not, it's not a real bikini and uh, it's not a... Not a, a real burqa. Yeah, a, 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 a real bikini would be too much exposure right. and a real burqa would, would, would sink you to the bottom. <laughs> exactly. And so that this is, uh -huh. these are, these are uh, very interestingly athletic, mm -hmm. uh, athletic swim material kinds of mm -hmm. uh, swim, swim outfits. Right. And they're not available in the United States yet. Well, you can order them on the internet uh -huh. uh, and so on. That's true of almost anything in the world now. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But they aren't regularly available here in the United States yet. And same way then, uh, same way basically hip-hop is one of those things in the middle where you get religiously committed hip-hop. You, you, you get uh, uh, gospel rap and so on. You, you now have Muslim rap mm -hmm. and you have Muslim hip-hop uh, that is a relatively strict, sometimes sometimes very strict theologically, uh, expression of Islamic faith, but using the hip-hop vehicle rather than the old-fashioned recitation vehicle. And we're talking about, with, uh, obviously, within the United States. <coughs> talking globally. We're global now. Globally. Uh -huh. I mean, the, 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 burkini, uh, the burkini is Australian. Yeah. But I was talking with some of my students, um, and they were saying, well, they've seen some of those actually 
in Egypt and in Muslim majority countries as well. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask you: you make a uh, you make a real distinction between civilization, on the one hand, and I guess culture, <coughs> culture on, on the other. And you 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 you've argued that it's a lot of what it's at stake here is not the clash of civilizations, the way mm -hmm. uh, Huntington. Huntington talks about mm -hmm. it, but rather modernity and different 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 attitudes towards modernity and different wanna, modes of modernity and different yeah. modes mm -hmm. of modernity you want to you want to sure. you want to just say something about that <laughs> well that's that's sort of a whole a whole lecture but i think <laughs> um, we tend to look at the world as if it is divided up into separate and discrete civilizations and so that people like huntington give you a list and they say okay you have Western civilization and Islamic civilization and Chinese civilization and so on. Now, 400 years ago, that may have been an accurate way of describing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the way the world was culturally structured. But really, almost since Columbus, but especially since the 19th and into the 20th century, being able to make a clean distinction between civilization X and civilization Y has disappeared. So that, um, for example, the, the Huntington argument is that civilizations tend to be defined by religion. And yet, the two great religions that he's concerned with, Christianity and Islam, are multi-civilizational. They aren't tied to one civilization. There are at least three different civilizations in Huntington's list that depend upon Christianity for their identity. And there are three or four major civilizations that are important part of the Islamic world. And, you know, bottom line, for example, is that very few people really remember that if we say Christianity is the core of Western civilization, Christianity is, is a non-Western religion. It didn't start up in England or France. It started up in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. um, so that what we have then is a set of interactive cultures that have been transformed by the industrial processes of modernity. And each cultural tradition has shaped modernity in a slightly different way. But we're really talking about multiple modernities, multiple forms of modernity uh, by the time you reach the end of the 20th century. And those interact and those compete. Uh, but um, arguing whether you should wear a burqa or a burkini or, or a burkini or a bukini, uh, that is an argument within modernity. It's not an argument between modernity and something else. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you imagine you know re recasting the the the, the clash in, in these terms? What are the what are some of the practical? what might be some of the practical consequences for living in a more peaceful world and in, in, in reframing it in this, in, in this way? I think that there's another Harvard professor whose name begins with H by the name of Stanley Hoffman, mm -hmm. who wrote an article that tended to get ignored because it wasn't quite as uh, rabble-rousing, if mm -hmm. you will. Mm -hmm. uh, but Hoffman wrote an article also in Foreign Affairs called The Clash of Globalizations. And what we are really involved in is then a clash of how does one construct a world society uh, that is resulting from all of the globalizations, different kinds of globalization uh, that, that we're involved in. And I think that there are two, there is a real clash, and there are two major alternatives. Uh, and the alternative one is um, an exclusivist, narrowly defined, if you're not for me, you're against me kind of approach. Uh, and the other is an inclusivist recognition of pluralism as a fact of life. Mm -hmm. And that uh, those are the two modes that are interacting. And one of the difficulties that we face now is recognizing then who are our allies. Mm -hmm. If, as we like to, th I like to think of myself as a proactive pluralist, mm -hmm. um, but that means then that there are a lot of Muslims who are my allies, and there are a lot of Muslims who are my enemies. But that also means there are a lot of Christians who are my allies, and 
also a lot of Christians who are my enemies in that conflict. And I think that the first step then is to identify how world interactions has to be reconfigured to recognize what it is that we really want. Do we really want democracy? Do we really want recognition of pluralism? Uh, and if so, then we have to recognize our Hindu allies and our Buddhist allies and our Islamic allies and our Jewish allies and work with them. But don't you think we, what we also need in order to make this really persuasive is to have a discussion about the pluralistic, uh, let's say the, the, the pluralistic uh, possibilities within the different religious traditions mm -hmm. themselves. Absolutely. Uh, I don't think, we, are we really having, are we having that the way, often the way it's framed in the United States is, you know, the secular secularists are the are the are the pluralists, mm -hmm. and the religious people are the ones who who so, somehow have some exclusive, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, <laughs> purchase purchase of, yeah. of truth. Mm -hmm. So how do how do we manage how do we manage to to to, comp to complicate that so we're we're aware of the fact that pluralism, in fact, you could even say emerged from from the many of these uh, religious traditions. Mm -hmm. I would. You know, it's one of those kind of dumb things that you say that, that if you want to get into an argument. Uh, but one of the things that I like to say is that now, after years of working in interfaith dialogue and so on, my real goal is to eliminate dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, because dialogue assumes that you have two different, two very different things that need to communicate with each other. And what we need to do is to reach a point where conversation takes place, communication takes place that transcends dialogue. I see. And I start, uh, I grew up in the Midwest. Uh huh. And uh, my father was a Methodist preacher. Mm -hmm. And there was the Methodist church, and across the street was a very liberal Lutheran church. Mm -hmm. And an interfaith service when I was a kid in that small town was when the Lutherans and the Methodists got together right. and it wasn't even conceivable that you'd get together with the Catholics and the fundamentalist Baptists. And so interfaith became then ecumenical and then now uh, it's when Protestants get together they don't think of it as interfaith and now even when you get Protestants and Catholics together it isn't interfaith, at least in, say, a place like Washington. Uh, for interfaith to really have purchase, you have to have real different religions. You have to have Jews and Muslims and uh -huh. Christians. Uh -huh. And I would like to see us able to go into that next step then, uh -huh. that, this, that uh, faith is a universal thing, that every person has, even an atheistic secularist, has faith in what he or she believes, mm -hmm. and that uh, so that faith is a given, and so interfaith dialogue should no longer be something that we would think of as necessary. That what we have to begin to do is to work in cooperative coalitions, if you will, where we recognize our common goals. Mm -hmm. And so I see, say for example, in Muslim Christian relations in the United States. It's not necessarily always um, political positions that, that I would agree with or that I would disagree with, but uh, Islam, for example, uh, relatively strict interpretations of Islam say that Islam prohibits gambling. Mm -hmm. And so in some municipalities around the country, Muslims and anti-gambling Christians have been able to work together uh, not mm -hmm. because they were having Muslims and Christians, right. but it was the anti-gambling people right. against the, right. the pro-gambling people, if you yeah. will. So the issues, in a sense. So that the issue the, becomes important. Uh -huh. saving, saving people from starvation, saving, right. saving people from genocide. Yeah. Uh, in Darfur, yeah. uh -huh. Muslims and Christians and Jews and, and mm -hmm. non-believers mm -hmm. have, for example, a, uh, a, a shared cause in trying to figure out how to stop the killing. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you how a nice Lutheran boy like Methodist you, boy. sorry, Methodist boy, sorry, I apologize. Yeah, I didn't go across the, the street. Interface. I never dated anybody <laughs> across the street. Uh, uh, a nice Methodist boy like you uh, got involved in, in, in Islam to begin with. Well, the simple answer is mm -hmm. that if you are, well, if you're my age, mm -hmm. if you were an articulate male, 
who was the son of a Protestant minister, yeah. everybody said, are you going to follow in your father's footsteps? Right. And I had no desire at all to be dealing with the problems of parish politics that my father was very good at coping with. Uh -huh. But I was interested in the study of religion. Uh -huh. And so as I was in, uh, high, in college and then when I went to graduate school, uh, staying in the study of religion uh, meant that I couldn't do s Christian studies. I couldn't go to seminary because everybody would assume I was going to be a minister. Mm -hmm. And so pick another monotheism. Yeah. And so I stayed within my real interest, but was able to do it with a specialty that didn't require me to be a parish minister. Mm -hmm. Tell me if, uh, I, I'm going to try to put this on a rather existential level. Mm -hmm. you, what is it that really draws you to Islam? If you just tell us something about what it is about the religious expression, what is it that what is it that that, that particularly drew you to it? Apart from the fact mm -hmm. that it was not <laughs> not, <laughs> not not something else, not something else. Yeah, uh, I think that the thing that draws me to the study of religion in general mm -hmm. is that there are certain sort of common issues that all human beings have to cope with, and that the one of the most effective answers historically for the common questions that are raised has been the, uh, the answers that have been provided by Middle Eastern monotheisms, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Mm -hmm. And so that I think that in pure existential theological terms, um, the working out of the varieties of ways that humans have been able to answer the great questions of cosmology and morals and value in society, uh, the way that they've been able to answer those questions within the repertoire of concepts and ideas of monotheism mm -hmm. um, is something that, that I find very interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in this sense, then, um, the Islamic, the Islamic sets of answers uh, become one way of getting entry into this broader issue of how do we as humans answer these questions. Mm -hmm. Very, very eloquently put. Uh, let's go to the 18th century because you've been mm -hmm. working on it, and I know that's the, cent that's the century in which Wahhabi uh, mm -hmm. right. uh, Islam and the, the brand that we're, that we're uh, uh, familiar with today, uh, mm -hmm. that's got the <laughs> negative press, has, has, uh, uh, has been indebted to. Do yeah. you want to say something? Is that part of w your interest in, in the 18th century? Yeah, it is. I think that, again, though, the, the 18th century book that I'm committed to doing uh -huh. is the whole world in the 18th I century. See. It's not just Islam, uh -huh. uh, but within that, then, looking at religion. Um, basically, the 18th century, in some ways, is a very interesting orphan historical subject that in a way, uh, especially if you're dealing with stuff outside of the West, uh, the 18th century is either sort of the last chapter in books on pre-modern society and sort of then, okay, here we're set to go, or it's the introduction to modernity. And the idea that the 18th century in and of itself was an interesting time uh, tends to get lost. But as people start looking at the 18th century, um, they tend, basically, people have tended to look at it through a lens that tries to understand, say, how modernity came out of it uh, in European history, uh, the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, the rise of the novel, all of this sort of thing, the new and the innovative kinds of things. Um, but even in Western historiography that pays real attention to the 18th century, uh, the dynamism of religious experience gets shoved behind Voltaire and the Industrial Revolution. And so one of the, my concerns is that we need, as we're looking at the beginning of modernity, we need to look at what's going on at that point. Mm -hmm. And that 
in most of the major religious traditions in this kind of transition time, the end of the medieval, the facing the new globalization and so on, you have a, an important set of people who are rethinking. They're trying to say, what are the real fundamental foundations and so on. Yeah, and so, not surprisingly, uh, the late 18th century, for example, is the time of the rise of Methodism. Mm -hmm. uh, the Anglican Church had gotten wrapped up in ritual and the priesthood and so on, and John Wesley was saying, well, you know, there are all of these new miners out there. There are all of these new factory workers out there. The church needs to go to them. And the church told Wesley, you can't hold the church service outside of a church. Mm -hmm. And so essentially he started holding church services in the, in the fields by the mines and so on. And he ended up then uh, being a religious renewer by trying to get back to the early sense of Christian community in a context now where uh, the accumulated institutional traditions had were not meeting the need. Mm -hmm. And across the board you find this kind of thing I think in the 18th century where you have movements that say the accumulated institutional traditions are missing the point of what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes in societies that are not uh, yet engaged in say modernization like the Arabian Peninsula the institutional history that's being rejected is a different institutional history but the kind of the methodology of let's go back to the roots let's mm -hmm. go back to the let's go back to the foundations let's get rid of all of this institutional overlay and get to the core of the faith that kind of pietism uh, as a western label or salafi uh, in arabic the the salaf are the pious righteous ancestors getting back to the, the way that the Salaf did it, the, mm -hmm. the immediate companions of the Prophet. And so in the 18th century you have this kind of Salafi pietist approach that in many ways prefigures uh, what goes on then for some of the important religious movements in the 19th and 20th century. Well, we look forward to, to, to reading <laughs> your book on the 18th century and to your lecture here. God willing it'll get done soon. <laughs> Thanks very much for being with us. My pleasure. And we've been speaking with John Bull, who is here to lecture at the University of Oregon as a Wolf professor. Thank you very much for watching.